an effort to stimulate discussion in current political issues. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of tonight is Professor Manuel Rodriguez Orellana, Associate Professor of the Northeastern School of Law, who has published in the field of Puerto Rico-U.S. relations. Mm -hmm. Professor? Good evening, uh, distinguished members of the panel, uh, distinguished members of the audience. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here tonight um, and present this forum on the status choices of Puerto Rico. It would be impossible to uh, summarize the history of Puerto Rico in the next three to five minutes, uh, but I think it is important to <coughs> square the issue within the parameters of at least this century's history. As a result of the Spanish-American War, and by virtue of the Treaty of Paris between the Kingdom of Spain and uh, the uh, Congress of the United States, uh, the Kingdom of Spain ceded to the Congress of the United States its former colony, Puerto Rico, um, a colony which it had held since 1493. Puerto Rico is an island 100 miles long, 35 miles wide. It is located in the Caribbean. Uh, next to the Dominican Republic and Haiti, which is, of course, next to Cuba, which is, of course, 90 miles from the coast of Florida. This small island has approximately 3 million uh, human beings who speak and think and write and pray and love in the Spanish language. In 1901, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, came down with a decision in the case of Downs versus Bidwell, in which it stated that whilst in an international sense, Puerto Rico was not a foreign country, since it was subject to the sovereignty of and was owned by the United States, it was foreign to the United States in a domestic sense, because the island had not been incorporated into the United States, but was merely a pertinent thereto as a possession. In 1980, again, the Supreme Court of the United States, in the case of Harris versus Rosario, stated and reiterated the powers of the U.S. Congress under the territorial clause of the U.S. Constitution to treat Puerto Rico differently from states so long as there is a rational basis for its actions. Since 1917, by an act of the U.S. Congress, these human beings inhabiting this Caribbean island
practical way out of this dead end street was the choice by the Puerto Rican people of a middle way, the path of autonomy. Puerto Rico petitioned Congress for the right to adopt its own constitution so that it could be self-governing in internal matters while keeping close bonds to the United States through the common citizenship, common defense, common currency, and common market. Congress agreed. The Commonwealth of Puerto Rico came into being and has served Puerto Rico well. The Supreme Court of the United States has described Puerto Rico's present relationship to the United States as unique, without parallel in American history. And those, of course, are quotes from decisions of the Supreme Court. The reason why Commonwealth status has been preferred by both the people of Puerto Rico and the government of the United States for the last 33 years are obvious. Statehood and independence are not in the best interest of either Puerto Rico or the United States, now and for many years to come. Both are seriously flawed. Commonwealth status, with its potential for growth, fits best the complex economic, social, cultural, and political realities of present-day Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico simply cannot afford statehood. Under it, we stand to lose close to 170,000 jobs, or roughly 20% of total employment on the island. In fact, the unemployment rate would increase to an intolerable and explosive 40%. Furthermore, the banking and financial sectors would be hurt deeply. Government revenue losses would be staggering. 294 million in rum duties would be lost, 47 million dollars in custom duties, 564 million in income tax revenues to be paid to the federal government. Total government losses in income as a direct result of statehood would climb to an estimated $1.4 billion a year, or roughly half the central government's budget at this point in time. Neither does it make sense for the United States to admit into the Union an area with half of the per capita income of the poorest state. The costs to the U.S. government would simply be unacceptable. Strong cultural obstacles also stand in the way of statehood. Culturally speaking, Puerto Rico is a Latin American national community. It is unthinkable, enlightened ideas to the contrary, that the U.S. would give up, that Puerto Rico would give up Spanish as its premier language. For about half a century, a vast program was put into effect to Americanize Puerto Rico. School was taught in English, with Spanish as just another subject. The language of government was English. Puerto Ricans became good, loyal American citizens, a large number of which learned English as a second language, but the Spanish language prevailed. Reality had to be accepted, and today Spanish is the teaching language, the main government language, and the only language of the Commonwealth Court. Present-day statehood leaders acknowledge this reality and say that as a condition to statehood, both Spanish and English must be recognized as official languages. It is to be doubted that an English-speaking nation like the USA will welcome into the Union a Spanish-speaking country which does not accept English as its primary language and does not want to be culturally assimilated. Of course, and it doesn't need uh, much arguing, the economic losses under the independence alternative would be staggering. Uh, we could go into, of course, the uh, effects on the common market, common citizenship, common currency, and common defense under uh, the status we now enjoy, on capital migration, on the loss of the American job market for our excess population and unemployed, which, to say the least, would be very damaging to our general well-being. 
The social and economic conditions generated by these extreme formulas could be potentially explosive to the detriment of both Puerto Rico and the United States. Although proud of its Spanish heritage and its separate cultural identity, the immense majority of Puerto Ricans would not even dream of giving up their American citizenship. They want binding ties with the United States. From the point of view of the United States, a fully independent Puerto Rico could potentially be an unsettling factor in a sensitive part of the world. Of course, the geopolitical, the strategic, the military importance of Puerto Rico to the United States cannot be understated. For all the reasons stated above, a middle-of-the-road approach such as the one represented by Commonwealth status actually constitutes the only sensible way to handle difficult and the contentious subject of the U.S.-Puerto Rico relations. Commonwealth means, on the one hand, a large measure of self-government for Puerto Rico, mixed, on the other hand, with strong binding ties with the United States. It is not an easy balancing act. Adjust adjustments will have to be made from time to time to keep it secure. But the advice being given by the independence and statehood leadership that will lean sharply to the left or to the right just spells disaster. The challenge for societies such as today's Puerto Rico is to safeguard the essential elements of their natural, national, cultural, economic, and social life while making certain that we are not left behind in the backwaters of underdevelopment or become another welfare dependent minority of the United States. I do hope we can face this challenge together in the future. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harabo. Our next uh, speaker, but before I introduce our next speaker, um, a terrible oversight for which I apologize. Um, I do want to mention that we are honored tonight uh, with or he is honoring us tonight with his presence in the audience, uh, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico, uh, the Honorable Jose Trias Monge, um, uh, illustrious scholar and an attorney. And we are very honored to have you with us tonight. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, the Mayor of San Juan, Mr. Baltasar Corrada del Rio, who is at the present time acting president of the New Progressive Party, which advocates statehood for Puerto Rico. Uh, Mr. Corrada. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the panel. Very pleased to be here tonight to defend statehood for Puerto Rico. The life <clears throat> of most Puerto Ricans is a constant search for two fundamental aspirations, security and freedom. That is what we want for each and every Puerto Rican. It is a fundamental aspiration of human beings. The reason I support statehood for Puerto Rico is that I believe that it will better serve in achieving security and freedom for most of our people and that it will help as an instrument to achieve those goals better than the other alternatives that are discussed. We are citizens of the United States by virtue of an act of Congress since the year 1917. We have been developing economically for a number of years it was said back in the 40s and the 50s that we could not afford statehood, that we were too poor, that we could not aspire to equality and full dignity as Puerto Ricans and citizens of the United States, that we had to give all sorts of economic incentives for 
companies and corporations to do business in Puerto Rico because then they would bring about the economic development that would ultimately allow the people of Puerto, Ric Puerto Rico to be on a better footing and perhaps aspire to political dignity and equality as citizens of the United States. Today, we've heard those who support commonwealths saying that still we have to continue waiting. And after 87 years of debate on this fundamental question, after 33 years since the inception of commonwealths, we are not ready yet that <clears throat> we will find some kind of economic disaster if statehood comes about and that Puerto Ricans will lose their culture. Well, I think that we find ourselves in a pretty bad situation as it is under commonwealth status. If commonwealth status is the middle of the road, that road is full of potholes and has created a lot of problems and obstructions toward the full development of the people of Puerto Rico. First of all, back in 1952, at the time of the inception of Commonwealth status, we had a 12% unemployment in Puerto Rico. Yes, we had only 38, 39,000 manufacturing jobs. We had almost 200,000 agricultural jobs and a 12% level of unemployment. Now, 33 years after Commonwealth status, do you know what the level of unemployment is in Puerto Rico currently? 23%. I heard here someone say, it, say that if statehood comes to Puerto Rico, we would lose 178,000 jobs. Do you know that we have 229,000 people unemployed in Puerto Rico under Commonwealth status? So if Commonwealth is the solution, I find that it's, it is quite a bad solution when the economy of Puerto Rico is, is in such a situation that even though the level of unemployment in the United States, in the 50 states, is 7%, in Puerto Rico is 23% and going up. It was 19% when Governor Hernandez Colon came in. Now that's up to 23%. Commonwealth, the underpinnings, the economic underpinnings of Commonwealth status were low wages, cheap labor, trade protections, oil quotas for foreign oil, and tax exemptions. Well, low wages are a thing of the past. We cannot continue to sell Puerto Rico on the basis of telling American companies, go pay lower wages to Puerto Ricans as American citizens. That's what we've been doing in the past under Commonwealth. I say no more. But in any event, now, we have raised the wages there. We cannot compete with low-wage areas like Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and many other places. So what happens is that companies that would come to Puerto Rico looking for low wages don't go there anymore. They go elsewhere where they can still pay even more cheap labor. Trade protection. There used to be a time when they said, well, Commonwealth allows Puerto Rican products to come free of tariffs to the U.S. market. But we know that we live in a world of free trade, that the trend is not tariffs, tariff barriers. The trend is let's open up international barriers so that competition and effective production and competitiveness will in fact determine who sells what to whom. And the Japanese are selling here in the United States and are competing, as are many other countries. We're selling abroad, and the name of the game is how do we improve our export-import situation on the basis of opening up markets abroad and allowing markets to be opened up here so that we can help consumers to be able to buy the products that are less expensive rather than using artificial barriers to protect uh, inefficiency in the production of American companies here, like happened in the car business. Now we are realizing that by making production more effectiveness, we would stand to gain in jobs, but not by keeping the straight protections of the past. Tax exemptions. 
I understand that the reason some people say that we will lose 170,000 jobs in Puerto Rico is that if federal tax exemption is eliminated, that some companies will go away. Well, <clears throat> I believe that is not true. They, they will not leave Puerto Rico. But in any event, right now, the Congress of the United States has under consideration a, a bill that would practically eliminate the benefits of Section 936 of the tax exemption. So we are at the whim of Congress, which by a stroke of the pen can eliminate that protection even if we don't have statehood. So we don't have to wait until statehood to have tax exemption eliminated under Section 936. It's almost now on the verge of being eliminated, and even if it is not eliminated, investors will see that there is such a degree of uncertainty there that they cannot feel comfortable in making a long-term investment in Puerto Rico anymore. That's why we have, among other factors, that 23% level of unemployment. Under Commonwealth, we are in a very bad economic situation. Our public debt is in excess of $8 billion. Per capita, we have a higher public debt under the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico than any of the 50 states in the nation. And even though we have that very high level of unemployment, 23%, the government of Puerto Rico employs 28 out of every 100 workers, which means that the government has become the employer uh, not only of last resort, but first, second, and third resort as well. Uh, and also it means that maintaining that bureaucracy represents a very high cost to the Puerto Rican taxpayers because we have narrowed our tax base under that very unjust commonwealth situation where corporations are given total tax exemption, but the taxi driver, the, te the school teacher, the policeman has to pay through their noses tax rates that are even higher than the federal tax rates. So we don't pay federal taxes, but we pay higher taxes to the Commonwealth government than most people in the states pay between the state taxes and the federal taxes put, to, put together. So if tax, federal tax exemption is the solution, well, we face higher taxes on the Commonwealth than we would under statehood. Then, of course, for those great economic benefits, they say we have to give up our political rights. We don't have the right as American citizens to vote for the President of the United States. We don't have two voting senators and seven congressmen in the House that would give us the political clout to be able to improve our situation. So we are accepting a status of political inferiority for some alleged economic expediency. I believe that under statehood, we will have full dignity, equality for the people of Puerto Rico, that we can prepare a, under the Enabling Act a provision that will allow an orderly transition from the tax and economic policies of today to the tax and economic policies of statehood for 15 to 20 years as a phasing of the payment of the federal taxes. And I believe that under statehood we can defend Puerto Rican culture. There is absolutely no national purpose on the part of the United States to obliterate the Hispanic culture of the people of Puerto Rico if we become a state. We have 50 English-speaking states in this nation. We need one Spanish-speaking state, not another English-speaking state. And it would not threaten the culture of this nation that we do so with a state out there in the Caribbean, 900 miles from the state of Florida, so that there will not be any threat to anybody's culture in the United States. In any event, the United States is a cultural plurality, and they can very well accommodate our people. We are very proud of being Puerto Ricans. We are very proud also of our American citizenship. American citizenship means to us full political dignity and equality, and at the same time, the preservation of our cultural heritage as Hispanic people. That will enrich in the life of the United States, will not detract from it. And I expect that as our people mature politi politically, they will realize that we cannot just benefit from certain federal funds, welfare, and so forth, that we also must accept 
rights as well as responsibilities, responsibilities as citizens of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Corrada. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Ruben Berrios. He is a senator at large in the Senate of Puerto Rico, representing the Puerto Rican Independence Party, which, as the name implies, advocates independence for Puerto Rico. Mr. Berrios. moderator and uh, fellow uh, uh, comrades, uh, Baltasar Corral del Rio and uh, uh, Ronnie Harau and friends, I must resist the temptation, at least for the time being, of uh, debating some of the arguments that have been brought forth and uh, should I shall try to uh, direct myself to the ideas I want to communicate to you. Because if I didn't do that, I would um, um, completely uh, uh, waste the opportunity I have in order to try to clarify some issues that are not very clear in the United States. I know there are some Puerto Ricans here. Uh, I know there are many. I'm very sorry. No voy a hablar para ustedes esta noche. I'm not going to speak for them tonight because uh, they've heard all this before. Uh, I'm going to s try to speak for those who are not knowledgeable in Puerto Rican politics nor history. Uh, so therefore, some of the things I might say will sound like an ABC, but I think we have to start from that point here in the United States. Or to start with, uh, some of our friends before have said something regarding this matter I'm going to touch upon, but I must pinpoint it very specifically. Puerto Rico is a full-fledged nation. It's a people. In Puerto Rico, it's not the United States. It is not Arizona before statehood. <laughs> it is not Alaska before statehood. And it is not Hawaii before statehood. It's not even Iowa before statehood. I must make this very clear because this is the crucial point which makes the Puerto Rican case totally different in U.S. history, in U.S. constitutional history, and in U.S. present-day reality. This is not to demean Iowans or, or, or Alaskans or Hawaiians, but the historical fact is that we were a full-grown nation when the United States troops invaded in 1898, the same as the Philippines and the same as Cuba. Before that time, the United States had been a nation created in the fight against colonialism, which only conceived territories as extensions of its natural borders where Americans moved in and when they constituted a majority, they became a state because it was inconceivable for them to be a colony. That's what they fought against. In Puerto Rico, when the Americans came in, there were a million Puerto Ricans. Huh? A million Puerto Ricans. Uh, that's a very, very high density of population, even at that time. One of the highest in the world at that time. So they come into a nation and they have never done that before. That's an experience for the United States history. As soon as they come in there, Puerto Rico becomes a territory of the United States. But contrary to Iowa or even to Alaska, besides being a territory, it becomes a colony because territories are transitory steps towards statehood in the U.S. history. But colonies are just forms of controlling foreign nations in the European usage. So the Americans come in and they establish a territory colony in Puerto Rico. From that time up to now, we are a colony. 
We have been a colony. We are the last remaining colony in the new world. And one of the few remaining colonies in the whole world. Why is Puerto Rico a colony of the United States? And why is it bad to be a colony of anybody? Those are the two questions I want to bring forth tonight. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States for basically the same reasons it was a colony of Spain. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States basically, basically, there are other reasons, but basically for geopolitical reasons. Spain used Puerto Rico as a base for controlling the access to all northern, central, northern Southern America, South America, and all Central America and Mexico. It was the easternmost outpost of the Spanish Empire, the closest point to Spain. When the Americans came into Puerto Rico, they came into Puerto Rico because they were thinking of constructing the Panama or the Isthmus Canal, and because they were expanding their markets in Latin America. So they controlled Puerto Rico, took over Puerto Rico, so Puerto Rico could serve as a military base and as an economic base for the control of Latin America. Puerto Rico means the physical and the psychological presence of U.S. imperialism in the Caribbean since 1898. It's as simple as that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a fact of life. It's not, that's not to say that Americans are bad. That just means that the U.S. foreign policy has been imperialistic. Any good American professor from Harvard would say that. <laughs> but, no. Now, why do I deride colonialism? And what is colonialism? Colonialism is very simple to describe. It's a system of government and of being in which the basic decisions that affect the lives of a people are taken by a foreign people. Simple as that. That's why the statehooders say Puerto Rico is a colony. And that's why independentistas say Puerto Rico is a colony. And that's why the majority of commonwealth as I know of say Puerto Rico has colonial vestiges. Of course, they can't say it's a colony. It's like if you have a son which is not very beautiful. You don't say he's ugly, you say he's not very beautiful. <laughs> eh? So that's colonial vestiges. Everybody agrees Puerto Rico is a colony because to say otherwise would be to deny reality. U.S. customs laws apply to Puerto Rico. U.S. military service laws apply to Puerto Rico. U.S. bankruptcy laws apply to Puerto Rico. U.S. fair minimum wages laws apply to Puerto Rico. Labor laws apply to Puerto Rico. Practically the whole U.S. code. You go to the Harvard Law School and look for USCA, United States Code Annotated, and that's colonialism in Puerto Rico, not in Massachusetts, because here they have two senators. And some representatives participating in the process of that law. But in Puerto Rico, it's colonialism. And colonialism is bad. It's always bad. It's bad, first of all, politically. Because it is anti-democratic by its very nature. And let us not confuse the exercise of individual rights with democracy. That's part of democracy. That's not total democracy. In order to have a fully constituted democracy, one must have the Republican form of government established in one own, one's own territory. And that means that the people who you elect make the laws that govern your life. In Puerto Rico, the people we elect, including Representative Jarabo and myself and uh, Mayor Corrada, make some small secondary laws. But the real laws, the important laws, are made by the U.S. Congress. And that is anti-democratic. That is not democracy. That's the first reason why it is wrong. The second reason is an ethical reason. Why should one nation make the laws and the basic determinations for another nation? The only rationalization for that would be that one people is superior to another people. That inequality can only be argumented from that point of view. The inequality amongst people, and I refuse to believe that people are unequal. I think they are equal. Even the Americans, which have had an empire in Puerto Rico for 80 some odd years, I think are equal to us. 
They're not worse. They're the same. <laughs> we may, might have done the same thing with St. Thomas if we'd had a chance in the past at an expansive economy like the American economy. <laughs> so I'm describing reality. But in Puerto Rico, economically, colonialism fulfills its eternal path. In the long run, it is always detrimental to the colonizing nice nation. Why? Because rules are made not for the benefit of the colony, but for the benefit of the metropolis. Something by chance might be to the benefit of the colony, but only by chance. In Puerto Rico, by chance, we had some years of prosperity after the war. Now, Puerto Rico, which used to be the showcase of uh, the Americas, is now what we call in the Puerto Rican countryside el, el niño bobo de la casa. You know, you hide him. The United States don't dare. Don't dare to show Puerto Rico anymore. Why? Because in Puerto Rico, we have such a level of poverty that a mud landslide kills 200 people. I imagine some of you might think you were think, uh, reading about India or some place in, in Eastern Africa. Well, that's Puerto Rico, where hundreds of thousands of people, after the whole progress of the American era, live in slums. Huh? and die in slums after a mudslide, where we have 23% and 30% real unemployment. Today in Puerto Rico, where we have 100,000 drug addicts. Today in Puerto Rico, where we have no agriculture. So colonialism doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because it doesn't. See, because the statistics are there in Puerto Rico to show that. It doesn't work in any sphere. Now, the big question is, what do we do about colonialism? Obviously, we cannot continue under colonialism because that's a problem, that's not the solution. Under statehood, the big problem would be that in the nature of the United States federal system, Puerto Rico and its two senators and seven representatives that Baltasar wants so much would be like a drop of water in a bucket of water. We would be a permanent tropical ghetto because two senators and seven representatives can do nothing to add political powers, which is what we need in order to promote our productivity in industry and in agriculture. What we need in Puerto Rico is political power in order to say we will not have entering our land a drop of Florida water like we import now or a sack of Kentucky manure like we import now since we have rain and we have horses in Puerto Rico. Huh? <laughs> and we will not have a chair coming into Puerto Rico when we can produce a chair in Puerto Rico. And we will not bring rice from the outside when we can produce rice in Puerto Rico. But in order to increment our industry and our agriculture, we must have political power. And that political power is called independence. That's why nations are independent. That's why they're not free associated states or commonwealths. Nations are independent because independence gives the nation the probability of working for itself. There are 170 independent nations in the world, one commonwealth. Is the rest of the world, including the American world, stupid and Puerto Rican so intelligent that we have discovered something new? I don't think that's the answer. I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is that in Puerto Rico we have a system of colonialism that stands and wins elections because it is to the benefit of the U.S. military establishment and to the benefit of U.S. 936 companies. And that way, it is very easy to obtain elections year after year. But we shall overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berrios. Uh, the uh, next part of the program is a brief uh, rebuttal, uh, a round of rebuttal, and we will begin, and this again, I repeat, was uh, determined by law, by, uh, with uh, Mr. Harabo. So I heard my friend, uh, Senator Berrios, speak about colonialism in Puerto Rico, and uh, I had doubts whether he was talking about us 
at certain points or someone else. Because the implication of what he's saying is that the conditions, the political conditions that exist in Puerto Rico at the present exist because of oppression or because the United States is forcing Puerto Rico through its system or transnational companies or whatever or the military establishment to stay as a commonwealth associated to the USA. But such is not the historic fact. What exists in Puerto Rico right now does so because the Puerto Ricans want it that way, because they have rejected repeatedly the party that Mr. Barrios chairs, and they have shown to reject consistently independence as an alternative. I don't know if Mr. Barrios has in his own mind to force independence on Puerto Ricans, to impose independence. And while one speaks about democracy and colonialism, the only uh, way that you can bring about independence is forcing Puerto Rico to choose a road it does not want to take. Of course, he uh, very ably uh, avoided the fact about the sense of identification that Puerto Ricans, the immense majority of Puerto Ricans, have with the American nation, with their citizenship. They do not feel oppressed. They feel that they have benefited from the relationship of Puerto Rico and the United States. And when we heard Mr. Corrada talk uh, deriding Commonwealth and the achievements of Commonwealth, and this really, sh uh, we should not waste our time here uh, trying to even argue because the books are filled with statistics about the great social and economic changes that Puerto Rico has gone through uh, way above what many, many rich countries have achieved. We have done more than they have and uh, the question should be whether Puerto Rico, if it had been a state in 1945, in 1950, would have achieved even half of what it has on their Commonwealth status. All those conditions that uh, were present and are now simply put to the side, the combination of those conditions, including political stability and access to the American market when there was no uh, uh, free trade to speak of, if we had been a republic, would Puerto Rico be what it is today? And of course, we must ask ourselves if there are no slums in the richest country on earth. Puerto Rico is so bad because it has slums. Well, I don't know of any country that, that doesn't have in the Western world uh, slums. Does that mean Commonwealth failed? That we have a high unemployment rate means Commonwealth doesn't work, so therefore republics don't work either. Sovereignty does not cure all evils because republics, as my good friend knows, also have slum problems, also have drug addiction problems. Now I believe each country and each people will choose for themselves their own historic direction and their own rhythm and evolution. You cannot impose on them any idea, any idea, not even if the rest of the world has chosen that idea. But you cannot force Puerto Ricans to choose what they don't want to choose. Uh, Mr. Corrada, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Berrios. When I hear uh, Representative Arabo speak, it seems as if the Independence Party is the one that has 45% of the vote and the statehood party uh, five because uh, all, all his arguments are directed against independence. Have you noted that? It's very interesting. <laughs> it is because he knows the way we're going. 
Uh, he knows statehood is an impossibility from every point of view. Uh, and the best uh, way to show that is that it is not convenient to the United States for Puerto Rico to become a state. That's why it isn't a state. If it were convenient, it would already be a state. Uh, it makes me um, uh, wonder what history has been read in Puerto Rican schools. And I advise Mr. Rava to read uh, Don Pepe Trias Monge's book to understand that Puerto Rico has asked for everything, Commonwealth, culminated Commonwealth, statehood, independence, and the United States Congress has been stingy. It has never granted Puerto Rico what Puerto Rico has asked for. Uh, so it's not the matter that uh, we have not asked for things. We have asked for everything. And the United States Congress has refused to grant Puerto Rico even small iotas of, of power that the Commonwealth has timidly asked for because the United States Congress wants to maintain Puerto Rico the way it is as a colony. Uh, of course, nobody wants to impose upon the Puerto Rican people independence. Uh, we go to the elections every four years. We are the only real democratic party proven so in Puerto Rico. We go, we lose, and we keep on going to the elections. <laughs> I would like to see how many votes the state or the Commonwealth Party had if they have lost elections for 30 years in a row, 39 years in a row. Uh, you know how votes are gotten in Puerto Rico. You divide 850 million food coupons to people, and then you tell them they're not going to get any food coupons if they vote for the PIP. You know that when you get into power, there's only room for your people. And of course, if you change every four years, then you have something to divide. But the PIP has very little to offer in terms of money and employment and so on. And we're proud of it also. Uh, so this thing of the result of one or another election to point out what should be is totally absurd. What we're discussing here today, what should be, not what is isn't on the basis of results of the last year election. To start with, statehooders and independentistas have a majority. So if we're going to speak about a majority, the majority of Puerto Ricans don't want commonwealth. So, you know, when you answer, uh, argue with numbers, you can make any side sort of uh, argument you want. I assure him that if we have been a republic, we wouldn't be the way we are now. You can be sure of that. Because we wouldn't have expelled two and a half million Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico to a slums in New York and in, and in every city in the United States to start with. We would have tried to develop we would have tried to develop our own land in Puerto Rico, our own resources in Puerto Rico. Uh, and we have obtained the economic miracle of having 300,000 people in slums while, while expelling two and a half million for other slums. I don't think that's progress. I don't see that's an example for any, I think that's the myth of the post-war era in Puerto Rico. Uh, and of course, republics have problems. All republics have problems. What I don't know of is of one commonwealth that has no problems because the only one we know has all the problems you can imagine. I know of no republic in Latin America that has 25% unemployment. I know of no republic in Latin America that has the alcoholism rate of Puerto Rico. I know of no republic in Latin America that has the degree of child abuse that Puerto Rico has today in Puerto Rico. That's the myth of Puerto Rico. And we have to destroy that myth of the status of Puerto Rico because it has not served us well. And that's what I come here for. And I tell you, in the Republic, we'll have trouble. We'll have problems. But at least instead of having one hand, we'll have both hands. And with both hands, we can work. And we can tell people that their ambition should be to work for a living instead to get food coupons and then win the elections and then be in power the next four years to divide a budget. That's what happens in colonial politics in Puerto Rico. And I come here to say that in order that none of you be fooled. Mr. Corrada. Yes. <clears throat> I heard Mr. Harabo say that if we become a, a state, we would lose about $1.4 billion, mostly in taxes that would be payable. Perhaps he's overlooking the fact that right now there is this proposal in Congress in the tax reform uh, bill that President Reagan said, se sent to Congress that would take away about uh, $1.2 billion in taxes from uh, uh, Section 936 companies doing business in Puerto Rico. So what happens? We may stand to lose at any time those funds without getting, again, the political equality. Furthermore, he, he uh, overlooked uh, mentioning that with statehood, we would have about $1 billion 
uh, in additional uh, federal funds such as full application there of health programs like Medicaid, the Supplemental Security Income Program, and uh, many others. Uh, furthermore, he overlooks the fact that uh, if we were a state, we would get much more economic activity in Puerto Rico. Take, for instance, federal procurement. Based on the population of Puerto Rico, if the Department of the Defense on non-strategic uh, supplies and procurement uh, would purchase in Puerto Rico what they purchased in, with an amount of over $80 billion throughout the country, they ought to be making purchases in Puerto Rico in excess of $1.3 billion in goods and services purchased by the DOD from the Puerto Rican economy. You know how much they are doing now? Barely over $200 million. Why? Because we don't have those two senators and seven congressmen calling the Pentagon, asking that companies in Puerto Rico be given those awards. They do not sit in, a, in the Armed Services Committee or any committee of Congress that provides appropriations that uh, they would know when the DOD goes there to get uh, their monies that they would have to accommodate by, by making sure that uh, some of those funds go to Puerto Rico. So he overlooks mentioning these facts. But I think that you have seen here tonight two fundamental elements. Economically, Puerto Rico is in a bad condition under Commonwealth. 23% level of unemployment, a lot of poverty, uh, uh, still uh, problems in, in the field of education and others. So there's nothing to boast about uh, our economic condition. Sure, we are not as poor as India, we're not as poor as, as Haiti, but we are right there in between what a state of the union would be and what we could be if we were a state and still there in a political limbo. And secondly, of course, this very serious question of political inferiority, of not having the right to vote for the president and voting representation in Congress. Now, Ruben says that two senators and seven congressmen are a bucket, uh, a drop in, in a bucket. Well, the two senators would be as much as the state of New York or California or Florida. The seven congressmen would represent a larger delegation than 25 of the 50 states because Puerto Rico, with its population of 3.2 million, has a larger population than, than half of the 50 states. So I, I don't think that is really a, a drop in the bucket. Now, I agree with Ruben that we have a problem of colonial, colonialism. The question is, how do we solve it? Do we go toward independence or do we go toward statehood? Statehood would be a clear solution to the problem of colonialism, as would be independence. The problem with independence is that Puerto Ricans are very concerned about it because they know it'd be economically disastrous. Look, they look around and see the Dominican Republic with more lands than Puerto Rico, with more natural resources than Puerto Rico. They look at Haiti with more land than Puerto Rico. They look at many of the Latin American countries. And they say, well, they found independence, but they don't have freedom. They don't have justice. They don't have progress. They do not, do not have economic development. That's why only 5% of the people support a man who speaks so eloquently and who gets so many applauses, but he doesn't get votes. And there is the question of concern. There is a question of concern about democracy. Yes, if Ruben were the president of the Republic of Puerto Rico, I think he would be uh, democratic. But who knows that he may only last half an hour because in come the communists shoot him and install a dictatorship of the left or of the right. So he's not going to be there anymore to defend it and speak those fancy words that he speaks. That is a major concern for Puerto Ricans. Puerto Rican. They see what happens to Cuba with the dictatorships from the left. They see the dictatorships from the right. They want security. They want freedom. In statehood, with dignity to our, our own cultural identity, we can get it. Uh, Mr. Corrala, if I... Uh, you have about one more minute. I just wanted to interrupt uh, to say that uh, democratically I have decided that uh, applause is okay. Please refrain from everything else. <laughs> oh, do I have an extra minute? You have not extra. You have one more. Well, <laughs> well that's, that's fine. <laughs> the interruption was at the right time, so we'll be there. <laughs> well, I think it, um, what I would like to do now is just, um, uh, I would hope that the three of you would 
uh, engage in a, a, a direct dialogue with each other. And maybe I would uh, start that uh, dialogue, <laughs> if I may, by uh, asking uh, Mr. Harabo, um, the concept of Commonwealth has been uh, very severely criticized by both of your um, uh, colleagues on the panel. Um, and they have pointed out some of the very uh, large problems that uh, the, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico now faces in terms of unemployment and other social um, uh, evils um, associated with poverty. What is the Commonwealth's plan or blueprint for dealing with those problems, uh, many of which have uh, apparently or allegedly arisen um, during the existence of Commonwealth over the last uh, 30 some years? Uh, what is the uh, Commonwealth's or the Popular Democratic Party's plan no. for uh, getting Puerto Rico out of the economic stagnation that it, uh, that it is facing at this point? Well, let's start with the, uh, with the last fallacy. Uh, Baldassar was saying how in uh, 1952 we had 12% uh, unemployment. 